everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to this session on the foundation and frameworks of coaching. It is my pleasure and honor to be meeting uh, all of you this evening, this afternoon for Christian. Christian is still in the afternoon. Uh, for the rest of us, we are already in the evening. Uh, this is part of our monthly, the Meta Coaching System series. We also have the series on neurosemantic self-leadership and parenting. And I am so glad and honored to see uh, all of you here who have been uh, in this session before. So one thing that I suspect is that if you are here for the second or third or the, uh, I don't know how many times, it means to say that you have gained something useful when you come to this session. And to me, uh, that is uh, uh, a big reward in itself for me to do this. So again, thank you for joining uh, me in this uh, session. Now, what I would just like uh, to do is just uh, as an introduction, because uh, there are uh, people who will be joining us uh, through uh, the recording. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Mazuki. I'm a neurosemantics trainer and meta coach, and I also represent Malaysia in the leadership team of the International Society of Neurosemantics. My uh, area of focus in terms of work, if I can call it work, uh, it is a joy, it is uh, something that I really love doing, is to help people to systematically develop skills in leading, communicating, and coaching in order to bring out the best in themselves. In the 60 to 90 minutes together, we'll be discussing just a little bit on why do we need a solid foundation uh, and frameworks for coaching. Just a little bit on that. And then we'll be going into the premises that constitute the foundation and frameworks of coaching. There are all together seven premises and I am uh, so excited to get into each and every one of them. As usual, I will pause for discussion after each main point. This is to give you the opportunity to ask questions, to comment or to contribute or even to think out loud. Uh, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about these points. And my style is to be light and humorous. So if I laugh or smile, I'm never laughing at you but at our silly human qualities. My purpose is to lighten things up, reduce being serious, and be more real. So again, I would like to uh, welcome all of you. Uh, uh, on my screen, I see Tessie, uh, Christian, all the way from South Africa. Uh, appreciate your being here. Uh, Hashem, uh, Guatching, and Sarah. Thank you very much uh, for being here this evening and let us just get going with the introduction uh, to this session. Uh, the introduction is why do we need a solid foundation and framework for the science, art and skills of coaching? Uh, two points that Michael uh, mentioned uh, in the book, The Meta Coaching System. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention uh, all of these things that we are discussing this evening is from the book, The Meta Coaching System that Michael wrote. So the first point, why do we need a solid foundation is that primarily because without this, without these foundation and frameworks, coaching is reduced to a mere tool chest of techniques, skills, assorted ideas and processes odds and ends pieces thrown together without anything to hold them together. And when I read that uh, in the book that Michael wrote, the first thought that comes to mind is my toolbox. <laughs> so whenever I want to look for my tools, I open the toolbox. Typically, I find it hard to find whichever tool that I needed to use because it is all messed up. I don't know how to, how to sort my toolbox uh, properly. So without the uh, foundation and frameworks, then coaching become a, 
you know, a, a collection of tools and we will not know which to use, when uh, and with whom. So that is the first one. The second point why we need a solid foundation and framework is to make things easier. Not just to make things easier, to make change easier. We also need a unifying framework to ground coaching. So it has a sustainable methodology that can step up to both academic rigor <laughs> and commercial realities. If coaching is used in an organization as a change management process designed to facilitate and manage generative change in people who are high potential, then the value of a solid foundation and well-designed frameworks is that it makes the change process easier. It's when we don't know how to do something or don't have the right tools that change becomes hard and difficult. How many of you have ever heard people say, change is hard? Is change hard or easy? Now, I, I do believe most of you drive a car. Maybe some of you drive a tank or whatsoever, but most people, they drive a car. Have you ever had a flat tire? Now, changing a tire, is it hard or she easy? Yeah. To change a tire is really, really difficult if not impossible, if you try to change the tire with your bare hands, try turning the nuts with your bare hands. It's almost impossible to do that. I would say for me, it would be impossible to change tire with just the bare hands. But what if you have one of those electric lugs, uh, nut trenches or the, the pneumatic uh, uh, stuff that they use in the tire shops? It's a cinch. Just like that, they can take off the tire and put on new ones. So it's a piece of cake. So how hard is change? It depends upon the tools you have, doesn't it? If you have the right tools, change is easy. Change then becomes a walk in the park. So that's why we need to have the foundations and framework because with this framework, it makes that change process easier. I will not promise that it will be easy, but it will be easier. Just like changing a tire, even if you have the right tools, you'll have to get your hands dirty and all that. And especially in Malaysia, uh, it's very hot nowadays. You'll get all sweaty uh, and wet uh, from perspiration, but it is easier, isn't it? So that's why we need the... Uh, the framework uh, and also the foundation. Now, the psychological foundations, the meta coaching system uh, premises, we've discussed those uh, in May. Uh, about we, we discussed about several psychologists to construct an interdisciplinary approach comprised of self-actualization psychology, developmental psychology, cognitive behavioral psychology, and systems thinking. So all of those are at the foundation of uh, the meta-coaching system. Now, what will be focused uh, today are the fundamental premises explicit in self-actualization psychology and comprise the theoretical frameworks which govern the meta coaching system. These premises relate to human nature as understood in self-actualization and to experience of identifying, developing, and unleashing human potential. So these are the premises that we'll be discussing. As I mentioned to you, there are seven premises, and I would say coincidentally, uh, in the last couple of weeks, I've been watching uh, this on Netflix. It's a, 
uh, it's a documentary uh, limited series i go for limited series i do not want to go for the series that goes on and on and on never finishing <laughs> so it's limited series about babies and when i watch this and as i was preparing for this uh, evening's uh, presentation then i realized a lot of what we'll be covering uh, today uh, this evening comes from how we human beings come into this world and operate in this world so this is this is why when we have a solid foundation about how human beings operate how human beings learn and how human beings uh, change then that change process as a uh, as a coach then that change becomes easier for us so what i'll do is i'll just pause here after that quick uh, introduction just to touch base uh, with you to check with you are there any comments uh, that you would like to make or any questions that you have uh, for the time being i'd also like to uh, welcome Zakaria, uh, who's just joined us. Uh, thank you for joining us, Zakaria. So, uh, anyone has got any thank comments? You, so, you're good right now? Okay. So, let's go for the first premise. The first one is the self-actualization drive is instinctive. The self-actualization drive is instinctual. So that's the first one. That's the foundation psychology. The foundation psychology is self-actualization is instinctive. And if the drive is instinctual, it is innate and therefore natural to human psychology. This means we have within us a higher drive beyond all of the survival or lower needs to learn, grow, develop, and continually move forward is inherent in human nature. It is part of our function. We develop over the span of our lives from immature to mature, from deficiency motivation to growth motivation. We move through many stages of development, social, sexual, cognitive development. Innate here speaks to the fact that it is in our nature to develop. And as I, and as I just shared with you that the documentary on babies. So as I'm preparing this, my, my mind now is going back to how babies, when they come into this world, um, they, they don't know anything about this world, but yet in just a very <laughs> short span of time, they're able to get somebody's attention. They're able to connect with another human being. They develop. And as, uh, uh, for those of you who are parents here and also grandparents if you are a grandparent like me you notice that that developmental process is so fast yeah so uh, that is what we are referring to this innate part that we uh, uh, are driven to grow to develop so with sufficient conditions for growth we will develop it is instinctual for us to both need and want to grow and change. Ongoing development brings out the best in people and creates a lasting and joyful satisfaction. So this makes coaching a strengths-based approach in human development. We look for excess and heightened strengths. What's working well? How can we make it work even better? This is what you do in coaching. Find, access, develop, and apply resources. It's not the case that something is wrong or bad with someone because that someone is still learning. Just like babies, they do things that they're not supposed to do 
it not it's not because they are bad but because they are still learning they are in that growth process so similarly our clients who come to see us as a coach we want to play to their strengths find the passions and unleash avenue synergies so from that foundation psychology these are the frame the frames or the framework that we use when it comes to coaching one is that people are wired for self actualization they are wired to grow they are wired to become more the self actualization drive is within and people have the needed resources so notice that self actualization psychology is about bringing out those resources that are already in people and from there it drives our actions as coaches these are the practices and actions so what uh, what uh, that drives us to do one is to awaken and challenge the potentials in individuals to call it forth bring it out and not to sell it short meaning to say not to give easy excuses or even uh, accept easy excuses because we know that the best in the person is there and to not let that person uh, sell themselves short so that's the first framework that we use the self actualization drive is instinctive it is innate and it is natural in a person so let me just pause uh, there and invite any questions or comments that you will like, uh, that you have thank you sarah anyone else any questions or comments good with that right so let's move to the second point the second premise is that self actualizing is dependent and activated by learning so the foundation psychology is that self actualization instinct is learning it is the human instinct people are natural and ferocious learners and what we term as evil is learning wrong and erroneous now when i watched that documentary on babies this one really uh, stood out because when they were uh, when when they were uh, doing all of these tests they were asking the question when do babies start to learn uh, and and for many people culturally we have been uh, influenced into thinking that oh babies are just helpless blobs they don't do anything it will take them a few years before they can learn anything but guess what learning is hardwired in babies they begin learning the moment they come into this world it is hardwired in them hardwired in terms of the processes of learning is already there from the time that they are born just for example uh, how many of you notice babies when they uh, i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to act out as a baby but doesn't really work out yeah you you know these babies they go with their hands going like that even when they don't even uh, they cannot even say, uh, say anything neuroscientifically it has been proven that that is not random movement they are take they are beginning to notice this thing is moving in front of them they are making observation about that that is deliberate movement the reason why it looks random to us is because they cannot control their muscles yet to hold it in place because neurologically they put a uh, uh, they put a baby in an mri <laughs> machine and the baby was about 2 months uh, old uh, and uh, the mother was the 
uh, was the scientist who's doing the experiment. So she signed the consent agreement. And even as, as, uh, as young as two months old, the brain is already firing uh, in the locations in the brain. Uh, at a, a two month old baby, the, the firing of the brain when it comes to learning is the same location as adults when they are learning. So even at birth, <laughs> children, uh, babies are already learning. So learning is a human instinct. While we have an innate sense of direction towards self-actualization, it is not inevitable. Instead, it, it is dependent on a wide range of variables. The process can go wrong as it can go right. It can be blocked and interfered with so that a person can become stuck and limited from moving forward. When this happens, it creates existential pain and distress. There's another, another reason for the primary of learning. We are not born fully human. We have to learn how to become human. It is the process of becoming. Unlike animals, we are not born with the innate programs containing the how-to information regarding how to be human, how to survive, how to thrive. We have to learn. We learn to become human over a, life, a lifetime span as we learn who we are, what we're capable of, what's important, how to manage ourselves and our relationships, and a thousand other things. A cat has the content in the cat to know what it takes to be a cat. A dog has the content within the dog to become a dog. That's why when we see animals in the wild, they are never confused. A cat knows it's a cat. A dog knows it's a cat. Uh, it's a dog. They are never confused. Only humans can get it confused. Yeah. So that's why when we talk about uh, uh, if you have read cases of feral children, children who are born uh, and uh, they got separated from their uh, uh, from their families, and they were raised by wild dogs. Uh, 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 Mowgli is about being, being raised by, <laughs> by uh, wolves and all that. But uh, dogs, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Maria Montessori talked about um, uh, uh, a, a boy who was separated from the family. Uh, and when he was discovered again, uh, he was already 10 years old and his behaving was the behavior of a dog because he was raised by uh, a pack of wild dogs. Yeah. So human beings, we don't have the content of what it takes to be a human being. However, it is hardwired inside of us to learn. So if our teacher is a dog, <laughs> then we learn how to become a dog. Just like that, um, uh, yeah, uh, they, they have a term, they, uh, Dr. Maria Montessori call it the savage of Avignon uh, because he was found in a uh, French village of Avignon. And there are many cases, especially in India, because of, uh, uh, because of war or whatsoever, children are separated from their families. They were raised by uh, wild animals in the jungle. Uh, we call them feral children. So they grow to imitate the, uh, the life of whatever surrogate parent that uh, brought them. So this is what we are talking about, self-actualizing is dependent and activated by learning. So uh, when so looking from this perspective, the frameworks that we use in coaching is the framework that people are great learners. I'm, I, I just pause there because uh, going back to that uh, uh, to that documentary. Uh, you know, as, as adults, when we, when we meet new people, 
we try to figure out how to get along with such uh, people. And yet children, when they come out into this world, they almost automatically draw you in because they are great learners about how people behave and they behave accordingly. And because of that, they just draw you in. Yeah. Now, the, the other thing is that all learning is not ecological. And the quality of learning is the quality of your life. So if what you learn gives benefit to you, and you do, did not learn about the ecological uh, impact of that behavior that can hurt or harm others, and, be, and because you are not exposed to that learning, then you can continue on in life and become like a narcissist. You become self-focused. You do not think about others. So that is why all learning is not ecological. So a person needs to learn about that ecology. So when it comes to the practices and actions that we as coaches bring to the uh, coaching conversation, this is where we challenge the client in order for them to review what it is that they learn. To quality control the learning and own responsibility uh, to learn. Meaning to say that the client takes the responsibility on themselves to learn whatever is happening out there. So this comes from this premise that self-actualizing is dependent and activated by learning. So in the coaching conversation, in the coaching process, what we want to do is we want to stimulate the client to learn for themselves because they already have the resources to learn and that is our role as the coach to get them to learn so that's why we challenge with quality control and then get them to own the responsibility to learn so let me pause there uh, with the second premise so any questions or comments uh, mazuki could you expand on the not all learnings are ecological, please. Okay. Now, uh, let, let me, uh, this was something that I watched in that documentary just last night. Yeah. Uh, little children, inside of them, they already, uh, the, the, the first instinct when children come into this world is the instinct of social connection. Because without social connection, we cannot survive. We need to have social connection. So that's why children, they, uh, babies, when they come out, the first thing is they connect with their mother, with the father, with whoever siblings, that, that social connection. The other is from birth, little children as young as six months old, they already seem to have a certain amount of morality. Morality in terms of uh, they are drawn to help us, people or things that help. They are uh, uh, pushed away from hindrance. Yeah? So if they see that somebody is helping another person, they, uh, they are attracted to, pe to people who help and they are pushed away from people who hinder other people. That is part of the uh, morality that is already uh, inbuilt inside of them. At the same time, there is this part of uh, this part of I call it tribalism. Uh, uh, in in the program, they call it uh, a team. So if they connect with someone, for example, the child uh, has a connection with uh, the mother. The mother is the first connection. So the child begins to relate. The mother is on my team. She's my tribe. Yeah? And if there is somebody else out there that is not considered as uh, his tribe, what happens is that the child will be attracted to the helper towards the mother, 
But if there, there is a helper towards someone of another tribe, they are not so attracted to it. So this, this is something that they, they did as a scientific study. Yeah? So their first worldview, and this is the matrix of the world, yeah, is people who are within my circle, these are the people that I want to, uh, to support. Yeah? People who are outside my circle, ah, let them be. I don't really care. So that is also part of what we consider as um, uh, ecological. So the learning that they, they get from there from very young is that they are very tribal because being in that tribe uh, gives them the, the safety. Yeah? So they have not learned to think about beyond that tribe. So the, 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 the aspect of uh, having the compassion for others who are beyond our small circle, that has to be learned, to be nurtured. Yeah? Okay. So as parents, we want to bring in uh, the concept of the child. Yes, this, uh, this is our family. That is uh, mommy's friend's family. And they're also close to us. And this is where we live in this world, in this country. And regardless of how people look, they are also human beings like us. So to allow them to transcend that tribalism. Otherwise, it comes out as racism. Mm, okay, okay. So, so my, my brain is picking up like it's almost like the self-other meta program, but instead yes. of self-other, it's my group, other groups. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank Can you. I just um, share uh, a small uh, bit of experience? Um, I sent my 10-year-old daughter uh, to boarding school in London and uh, ecological to me meant that it would serve me because I wanted her to come back and speak the Queen's English because it's London after all and it would be ecological for me to send my child, my only baby uh, to the best education in the world which is the British education one would think, but she came back with an American accent. <laughs> After one year, she was like, oh, baby, you know, and all the slanging. And that was so unecological for me, thinking that she would come back, you know, speaking proper. So it, it, from my sense of it, ecological means it serves uh, the purpose of the origin, of the originator the source. So if I think that, uh, if I'm going to check, is this ecological for me, it's going to serve me, my decisions, my actions, my, my uh, associations. If it's going to be ecological, it's got to be ecological in the context of what I want. That means it's got to serve me. And then I'll say, I'll check, check, check. Okay, let's go and do it. So I thought that it's ecological to send my child to the best education, and she came back slanging like the, you know, the hobos of, of Soho. <laughs> so it didn't turn out well at all. <laughs> and then, uh, because when she went there, you know, um, London boarding schools, they, they come from everywhere, Nigeria and everywhere, included Ghana and so on. And uh, she picked up everything. And so she could slip in and out of roles. So at the end of her, like, stint, she she became ecological to me because then she started <laughs> speaking right. So ecological to me means it serves um, the purpose. It serves the system that it was meant to serve. Okay. Okay. So in this context, thank you uh, for that, uh, Tessie. In this context, ecological, as uh, Christian mentioned, so we are talking about the matrix of self and matrix of others. Uh, so when, when I'm talking about ecological, so I want this for my child. So that's others. So does the child want this as well? So some, uh, and frequently as parents, uh, we overlook whether that, that question, does my child want this? Oh, well, she wanted it all. <laughs> to her, it meant I, I'm going to soak everything up. I don't care whether it's good 
psychological. <laughs> okay. Right. So thank you uh, for that, uh, Tessie. Yeah. So let's move to our next point. And uh, before that, I'd like to welcome Ines. Thank you for <laughs> joining us. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> Good evening for you. Thank How are you, you. Mr. Uh, great, great. So we've covered two premises already. Uh, okay. So moving on to the third premise uh, with respect to the foundation uh, uh, and framework of uh, coaching. So let's move to the third one. And the third one is people self-actualize by accepting and owning responsibility. Now, the foundation psychology for this is that self-actualization is semantic. It's driven by meaning. It is a function of meaning and meaning-making. Now, while both the predisposition for actualization is innate, as are the personal powers which enables us to take charge of learning and development, there is a condition. Every person has to take ownership of these response powers. We have to proactively take the initiative by activating our human freedom of choice to accept and own these powers. When we say that a person has all the resources he or she needs, we mean that human beings have the personal powers for responding and learning. We can combine this to create a whole range of resources. These are the powers of thinking, emoting, speaking, and behaving. Clients are empowered when they accept and take ownership of these response. Owning these responses activates and develops one's ability or power for learning. Failure leads to regression, to childish, passive, reactive, and immature processes. With the self-actualization drive is the power to take charge of one's own life choices, decisions, and career. So the framework that we use for coaching is that you are the meaning maker. So this is what we bring to the client. You are the meaning maker. It is all about meaning. The meaning you give is the instinct you live. So that's why if you remember in APG, one of the first patterns yeah, one of the first patterns that we work on is the ownership of your power zone. Because by taking ownership of your thinking, feeling, and saying, doing, only then you are responsible. In, the, in that, you are thinking and uh, feeling originally. So you are the origin of that thinking, feeling, and your speaking and behaving is also, uh, or also originates from you. So the framework that we use in coaching is that we are saying to the client, you are the meaning maker. So if you have unresourceful toxic meanings in your life, then change those meanings. So in terms of practices or actions that we bring to the coaching uh, conversation is to get the client to construct great meaning. Learn meaning-making skill. And the dialogue between the coach and the client, it's a, a two-way conversation. And that dialogue is also all about meaning. So uh, this is the third premise that we use in coaching, that the premise is that you, as the client, you are in charge of your life when you accept and take responsibility for your four central powers. Okay, so that's the third premise. So let me just pause there uh, and invite any questions or comments. 
So I problem with uh, motivating a learner. So how do you overcome this? Sorry again. It's about motivation. Motivation. Yeah. If a learner and mentee in this case has no motivation or unmotivated to learn, mm. how can you overcome this situation? And okay. what is motivation, in fact? So there is something that you need to do out there, uh, and and I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, saying this to the coaches that I see in front of me. <laughs> There's something that you need to do out there. But you are not all there in terms of doing it. There is no energy. There is no motivation. So what's the issue? Come on, watching On Saturday, it will be the first pattern that we'll be talking about. <laughs> it's yeah. intentionality pattern. Yeah, the oh. pleasure of doing the task. Yes, that's uh, one. Uh, uh, what do you call one uh, uh, parameter that we take into account. When there is no motive, the first place that we go to is what's your intention of doing it. So that's why in the APG and stages, that's the first pattern that we go for. Instead of the power zone, the first pattern is the intentionality pattern. Because that will define or create that passion, that power. When you link the, the activity with your highest intention, that's when you get that drive. And the reason why many people uh, don't have that motivation, don't have that passion to do what they need to do is because they have lost sight of their highest intention. Yeah. So to answer that question, we, we explore what is the person's intention. And we go up the highest level of intention because the moment you reach your highest level of intention, there's nothing stopping you from, uh, from doing that. I hope I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we move to the next uh, premise, number four? And number four, the premise number four is self-actualization is social. Socially supported and experienced. Remember, I, I mentioned to you that the first drive in a child is the social connection, the drive to be socially connected. The term self-actualization is misleading on several accounts. While it accurately identifies that this is about the self, about becoming the best that you can be, the paradox is that self-actualization is not about you nor does it come exclusively through you. Because it's human service. nature itself and is it is social. very inexpensive. We have a very interesting sign-up model to give you five gigabytes of free storage. Okay, somebody click on the, on, on the link that Christian gave and then uh, you've activated your, your browser. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Because human nature itself is social, and because we are social beings, we do not unleash our highest potentials apart from relationships with others. As social creatures, we need others in learning and developing. Without others, we would never fully enter the human experience. It is through others that we first learn how to be human. Remember, I mentioned to you uh, earlier, uh, in the second point, is that we do not have any content how to be human. We need to learn how to become human. So it is through that human experience that we become human. 
Others set our early agendas and teach us how to relate, communicate, love, hate, forgive, resent, and the whole range of social emotions. The best self-actualization occurs through collaborations, healthy relationships, partnerships, and team efforts. That is because it is with and through people that we discover and create ourselves. It is with others that we work to make our visions and values real. And because we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us, we can now rise to new levels of development. So the foundation psychology for this uh, premise number four is that self-actualization is being responsible, responsible. Responsibility is the true source of uh, power. Every step of responsibility is an act of self-actualization. Now, I'm noticing. Hold on, let me just check. I'm noticing a little bit of a mismatch over here. Self-actualization is... Number four. Yeah. Ah, okay, let me, I've got the slides a little mixed up. So that's why uh, it should be, yeah, let me just stop share for a moment. I need to uh, change that slide. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just uh, change that. Okay, let me just uh, put it here. Self-actualization is social. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Self actualization is social. I, I mixed that. Uh, I got the slide title mixed with uh, semantics. Yeah. Now, self actualization is social. It is with and through people. The D needs, our, uh, our deficiency needs are all socially dependent. So the framework that we are using uh, over here is how you get along with others is how you get along in life. And little children, that is the first thing that they learn that is to, uh, to get along with uh, other people because they know that if they don't get along with people, they'll die. So that is part of, <laughs> part of the uh, survival uh, mode that they go into. So you self-actualize with and through uh, people. Now, let me just, uh, oh, I did not share screen there just now. Let me just back up. This is the one. Self-actualization is social. 
It is socially supported and experienced. Uh, it is with and through people. D needs are socially dependent. So the frameworks here is that how you get along with others is how you get along in life. You're, you self-actualize with and through people. So what we do over here is that uh, in terms of our coaching practices and action is to help our client to develop social skills, learn win-win uh, attitude, develop healthy interdependence with people. Uh, notice the word interdependence because as a child, we come into this world fully dependent on others and then at the age of four, sorry, at the age of about two and also at the age of about uh, 11 or 12, we go through the individuating process. So that's the part of learning how to be depend, uh, independent. So from uh, dependent to being uh, independent and the mature adult is when they learn that they are interdependent with other human beings. So to be able to develop that healthy interdependence with people. So that's uh, premise uh, number four. Self-actualization is social. It is socially supported and experienced. So let me just pause that and invite questions or comments. Mazuki. Yes. Um, self self actualizing is with and through people. Hmm. How come? We talk about self. So so. Uh, it's about leading myself hmm. to build my potential mm. so it's about me becoming better than i was mm. it is it's all me i and mm. myself yeah suddenly you're saying it's with and through people mm. because all the d level needs the, d means, d means the, what uh, the physiological need the safety and security need the uh, love and belonging need, the esteem needs, the deficiency needs, uh, as Abraham Maslow calls it, the D needs. In order to fulfill those needs, you need to connect and relate with other human beings. So that's what it means that it is through people. You need to connect and relate with other human beings to fulfill even your physiological need uh, as a child. Um, they, they need to learn that they depend on their mom or their dad in order to, uh, uh, to eat. They, they need to depend on their uh, siblings in order, to, uh, in order to play, in order to learn. So it is through people that we are gratifying our deficiency needs that we are moving up into the self-actualization need. So... Uh, the deficiency need is about me getting what I, uh, what I need. And in order to get what I need, I need to interact, connect, and relate with other human beings. So that's what we are referring to. It is through people, through our social connections that counter, we fulfill. Counter, what? Counterintuitive. Hmm. Hmm. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Because you want to be your best self, you can only get there with the help of others. Yes. Phew. <laughs> None of our politicians are going to make it. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. So, so I love this because like, if we say I want to develop um, personal genius, personal power, it's got to be through our being needs met, meeting our being needs. Mm, yeah. So um, what I'm saying is it's only available to those who are willing to um, be selfless. Ha, 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 ha. Very funny. 
<laughs> uh, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Zig Ziglar who said it. He said that to be self-serving, you have to be selfless. In another, uh, in, a, in another situation, he said that uh, when you um, uh, give to, to people what they want, you'll get more of what you want. Somebody teach it to our people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> okay good so let's move to the next point premise number five which is self-actualization is semantic yeah? self-actualization is driven and governed by meaning and meaningfulness and the meaning making processes, self-actualization is semantic. The foundation psychology is that, now I think I've got that. Uh, yep, let me just stop share again. <laughs> oh dear, this is the second one. Ah, the previous one. Uh, I mixed it up with the previous one. So let me just, self-actualization is semantic. Sorry about this. Let me just make sure that we are on the uh, right slide. Yes. Yes, uh, this content is from self-actualization from uh, Michael Hall. Thank you. Uh, yeah, self-actualization is semantic. The, the foundation psychology here is that self-actualization is semantic. It is a function of meaning and meaning making. So I used this slide earlier, but this is what this slide is for. Uh, that it is uh, semantic. It is uh, self-actualization is driven and governed by meaning and meaningfulness and the meaning-making process. Learning to make ever better and more useful maps is not enough. We need to create maps that make all of life richly meaningful. Are there significant meanings which inspire Self-actualization requires the ability to create inspirational meanings. This entails the ability to define things in a meaningful way. The crucial role that meaning plays in self-actualization arises precisely because we do not have instinct. We use the human instinct of learning to first learn about three aspects of meaning what it is, how it works, and what it is good for. So that's why those of you as parents, you realize that uh, uh, your, your, your children at about the age of, I think about three, they start asking, why mama, why? Uh, if you remember, you, it drove you crazy. <laughs> why? When you give an answer, why? So when they ask that why, they just want to know what it is, how it works, and what it is good for. Yeah? So doing this requires and activates our meaning-making skills of thinking, representing, classifying, framing, and so on. Yet, 
all meanings are not meaningful nor even true accurate or healthy we can and do learn stupid things hurtful things things which work to our detriment meaning can be dysfunctional even toxic so a critical meaning making skill is the ability to unmake meaning that is to suspend meaning and de commission it in the end when we create significant meaning we activate our motivation and passions so that we grow in ways that actualize our highest values and visions the self actualization need is to see how things make sense are meaningful hold significance and are valuable without meaning life and effort feel futile so we become passive and reactive even destructive so this is the spiritual dimension of vision hope meaning passion and inspiration so the frameworks that we use in coaching is that you are the meaning maker it is all about meaning the meaning you give is the instinct you live and as coaches we help clients construct great meanings so when they construct great meanings they take full ownership of that meaning making process yeah so this is this part on self actualization is semantic and i Uh, accidentally brought out this slide earlier uh, and this is where it should be regarding self actualization is semantic yeah so any comments marzuki i have a question about the one earlier not about yeah. the semantic one um is it i mean is this i'm I'm trying to understand here about the self actualization and after getting all the D needs met, right? Yeah. So if let's say someone who doesn't have their D needs met, do they not self actualize? They'll have difficulty to uh, to self actualize because as Abraham Maslow puts it, you get stuck in the jungle. and the reason why you don't self actualize is because your meaning making faculty is i'll use the word is distorted so your <laughs> meanings uh, are distorted you create unresourceful meaning for example um to gratify our d needs when you uh when you fully understand them it doesn't take much for example in terms of physiological need uh food you don't need much food in order to uh fuel your body yeah however when meaning making uh goes out of whack people put meaning that Uh, food is love Ooh. so parents sometimes uh, you do this to your children uh here uh, have this noodle uh, i've just cooked this noodle for you i cook this because i love you so the distortion between food and love is there so when the when the child goes into feeling unloved what do they do they go and eat mm. okay so when you have that distortion then that's how people get stuck in the jungle uh, abraham maslow used the term uh, jungle you cannot rise above your deficiency need and because of that you cannot go into the self actualization need uh, uh, because all of your energy is being used in fulfilling uh, those deficiency need that's one and the other is 
you have not learned the skill of meaning making in the right way because your meaning making is cognitively distorted and because of that you cannot make the higher level meanings up there yeah so uh, there is there is part of self actualization uh, psychology is to learn how to succinctly gratify your uh, uh, your lower level needs because each and every one of us we cannot run away from the uh, deficiency needs because these are part of our need so this way call it need of human being uh, for example food i can fast for a whole day from morning until evening and after that uh, the, uh, i would I look at everything. Everything looks like food <laughs> because I'm 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 driven by the need. Deficiency need is driven by deficiency. When it is deficient, your energies, your thinking, feeling, your saying, doing is driving you to fulfill that. Yeah. So that's why we need to learn how to gratify it uh, succinctly, and each level of need can only be gratified from that category it cannot be gratified from another category esteem cannot be gratified by property but yet people uh, 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 base their esteem on property so they buy more property they buy more cars they buy more houses they buy more clothing and all that but yet they still do not feel more esteemed because esteem is gratified by uh, the kind of skills that you have the competencies that you demonstrate to this world that will bring the esteem from others and also esteem of self self esteem is unconditional and yet when people um, confuse between esteem and confidence that's also what's causing them to go into that Uh, uh, into that uh, downward spiral. So that is why uh, uh, in in unleashing uh, vitality, that is the first uh, component to self actualization psychology. Unleashing vitality is about learning how to gratify our uh, lower level needs succinctly, so that we can become creative in order to gratify our self actualization needs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and most recently, uh, I, I, I come across. No, uh, I come across a, a, a study. Uh, have you ever noticed that how uh, uh, people who are poor they look stupid? Have you noticed that? Hmm. Why? Poor people don't have enough food to eat. When they don't have enough food to eat, they don't have the energy. And when there is lack of energy, the body shuts down certain functions in order to get the body to survive longer. And the greatest use of energy is the brain. So that's why the body shuts down the brain from working. So that's why poor people appear stupid, just like our phones. When it is on low battery mode, it shuts down a lot of the functions. So that's why we need to learn how to gratify our needs. So that's why that physiological need is all important down there. Do not overlook that. We need to gratify those needs on a daily basis. Uh, we have to look to keep there, so yep. you make all. Okay. Sorry, is that? There's water. There's a sign plus water. Hmm. Okay. So, anyways, thank you, Marzuki. That one, that that was really um, clarifying. So, in order, it, unless the D needs are gratified, you're constantly going to be in a survival mode, and so. Yeah. Therefore, you won't be able to think about self-esteem or self-actualization for that matter. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Marzuki, can you give us an example of how a coach would um, help a client, uh, what did you say just now, um, create more robust meanings or um, you know, amplify their meanings? Yeah. yeah. So the first part as what we uh, uh, mentioned earlier is to be able to have that critical thinking in order to quality control our current meanings. So that's where the, um, the NLP communication model, the meta model of language, it gives us the tools in order to identify the cognitive distortions that uh, we have experienced. Now, it means that our meanings may be cognitively wrong. So, Having the skill of critical thinking to use the uh, cognitive distortion uh, uh, elements in the meta model of language to clean up our thinking. Then to, to be able to take all the uh, uh, to be able to take all the uh, unresourceful uh, uh, toxic meanings and to decommission them and then to bring in new meanings. So that is where, as a coach, what we want to do, we want to get the client to explore. Uh, so uh, if you notice part of our conversation at the meta levels, asking the person, so how long have you had that, uh, that meaning? So it's always the frame that's wrong, not the person. So you've been running that, uh, that frame inside of... So how does it, that serve you? How much longer do you want to... Uh, continue with these frames and then to move to the next step building new enhancing meanings we start off by so how else how differently do you want to think about this so now we are going to the creative process of finding what more empowering meanings and then begin layering them i have this client who just doesn't want to admit that he's got all these co cognitive distortions because mm -hmm. like, who would I be without all my self-sabotaging problems? Mm. You know? So he's like oh, clinging on so hard to, uh, well, look, I'm justified. If you were, and if you had gone through that, you'd also be like that. Mm -hmm. You'd also be behaving like that. So there's a lot of, I want to keep my, my messes. Yeah, yeah. So that's why at the core of uh, at the core of coaching is uh, taking responsibility for their frames. Mm. Yeah. So if the frames are hurting them, and yet they want to keep it, so go ahead and keep it. You can have your frames, and you can have your <laughs> suffering your pain <laughs> because your frames are causing you the pain. Unless and until you get rid of those frames, you'll never get rid of the pain. So, so if they say that, I'm okay. I want to live with this pain for the rest of my life. Yeah, good luck to you. Good luck to you. Exactly. <laughs> good luck to you. Yeah. Okay, let me just cover uh, the last two uh, frames. Frame number six is self-actualization occurs one conversation at a time. It occurs one conversation at a time. So the foundation psychology here is that self-actualization is conversational. We think, learn, and create meaning through language. Yeah? As symbol using beings, we talk our way to the best meaning making, deciding for relating and understanding. The coaching dialogue enables us to let our meanings pass through us. Those meanings. As meanings pass through the coach and the client in that conversation, we engage in a very special, intimate, and personal conversation. New emergent meanings arise. Through the conversational dialogue, we 
co-create with the client a new game plan. Through this conversational dialogue, we are able to get to the source or heart of things, the client's meanings. Conversation is what invites us into the human experience in the first place, and it introduces us to the world of symbols. We hear words and begin to integrate a language system. Conversation develops our consciousness as we accept and set frames of meanings about things. No wonder conversation can also do us damage. Words communicating ideas and setting frames can build limiting and self-sabotaging worlds as well as empowering. Conversation also lies at the heart of thinking. We think mostly through talking to ourselves. Yet our self-talk conversations can drop out of conscious awareness so that we lose awareness of what we are saying to ourselves. These often have the other trances that operate in the back of our mind. No wonder conversation and especially the meaningful dialogue of exploration into meanings intentions, values, and visions can work powerfully to transform these conversations. Through the coaching conversations, clients discover their own frames, evaluate them, and transform them. This is the magic of coaching. This explains how a coaching conversation can facilitate incredible breakthroughs for transformation. So with that foundation psychology, the frameworks or frames that we use in coaching is that you can't talk any better than you think. Well, you can't we change one conversation at a time. One conversation at a time. So what we take into action in the coaching practice is to help the client to develop critical thinking, to externalize your thinking. Externalizing thinking is, that's why as, uh, as a coach, frequently we feed back to the client what they say. Because sometimes what they say, they are not even aware of what they're saying. So we feed it back so that they can hear. Oh, did I say that? Now they are hearing their own thoughts. Otherwise, the thoughts are running as the in the back burner. They are not noticing those thoughts that are disempowering them. So the coaching conversation is a change mechanism. It allows the client to evaluate, to quality control, uh, to be critical of the thinking and to begin taking in the thinking that is most useful for them. So that's why uh, premise number six here is that self-actualization occurs one conversation at a time. And this is especially, uh, I would say this is especially uh, critical for clients who come to see you with a lot of things at one go. Uh, have you ever had that uh, uh, situation? They come with you with so many uh, very important things at the top of their minds and that's okay. why I keep noticing what Michael does is that uh, he would repeat to, uh, to the client all of those things mm. then ask the question so which one of these is the most important for you for us to have a conversation right now so one conversation at a time okay so any questions or comments but it was that because I remember I was straight and I took a right and I was there in the middle of the road. And I'm right. No, I am right. Hello? Is that you? Uh, Madonna, you mentioned that. I did not quite catch you. It's okay. Uh, anyone?
So are you ready to go to the last uh, premise? And this last premise, number seven, self-actualization for improved performance. Isn't that what our clients come to see us for? Self-actualization is neurological. It is embodied and it shows up as performance. It is in our neurological. So a person who says that they are self-actualizing and not performing is not really actualizing. So that's what we mean by actual, to take your highest meanings into actual performance. So thinking and talking is not enough. Action is required for us to facilitate the self-actualization of potentials and to make them real, they have to be translated and experienced in behaviors. The learning is not mere intellectualizing. All of the dichotomies that we set between mind, body, and emotion by which we treat these as different things are only ways of talking. They are not real. It is always a system, a mind-body-emotion system. Real learning is always ultimately behavioral and shows up as a behavioral change. How do we know that we or another have learned something? There is a change in behavior. There is a new and different response. We truly know something when that knowledge is not just at the level of intellectual concept. It is also at the level of know-how. This is the neurosemantic factor. The meaning, semantics, which we create in our minds via our internal movies with all of the words that we use uh, become the signals and commands that inform the body and neurology. In this way, meanings become felt experiences. Muscles encode the memory of those learning. The ultimate step in coaching is action. It is the performance toward an achievement. For this reason, coaching uses tasking for action plans, monitoring, feedback, continual improvement, uh, and refining, environmental and social support, and many other tools. These are used to translate the learnings into actual difference in one's experiential life. When a person experiences an enhancement in performance, then he actualizes his potentials and grows or develops to the next level. So the frameworks that we use is that coaching is experiential. You don't, if you don't experience the conversation, it is just a chat. So when we put that into action, we induce relevant states in that conversation. Actualize through practice, deliberate practice, then test and experiment whether those actions have become real in the client's life. So this is what we are referring to as the premise number seven here, self-actualization for improved performance. If there is no improved performance, then it's just a chat. We have not achieved that change yet. So uh, the test for self-actualization is the change in behavior that brings a person closer to their uh, goals. Okay, So that's the final premise, number seven, uh, self-actualization for improved performance. So uh, I'd like to open to comments uh, regarding that particular point. Any comments? The client, um... The way the client shows up 
for the coaching session speaks to the um, result that that conversation will produce. Mm -hmm. So I find that some clients are not willing to show up authentically and might even bring an uh, imagined thing to the conversation. So I find that um, I need to call them out very quickly so that we frame that situation well. Otherwise, um, people might take away uh, that, that coaching was not successful or it didn't drive performance. So that's where the authenticity needs to come in. Mm. That the client is there for themselves. Uh, and uh, the reason why I say that is that sometimes when the coaching is paid for by the company, the client is not there for themselves. Mm. So I have, you know, over the years, a few of these ones, especially the more senior they get, like, so, so what? So what are you doing? So very, very early on, I have to say that, um, you know, set the frames around coaching and the conversation and spelling it out. Like, you know, we are not going to uh, be very high performing in this conversation if, if it continues this way. Yeah. So let's continue to have a chat just like you wish. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if... Um, so that's why the first prerequisite to coaching is the client is coachable. Yeah. We want to be coached. Uh, so, so, so this is the difference uh, in, in, term, in psychology. We talk about this, you know, I think, in May, that the psychology that's driving um, uh, a person who wants to be coached is the healthy psychology mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense that these healthy people, they face problems in life the problems that they face are the problems of growth not the problems of becoming uh, uh, bringing themselves to ground zero yeah uh, so they have a lot of uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, psychological issues about themselves so that's what therapy is about now, coaching is about people who want to grow, who want to achieve more. They want to do more. Uh, so these are the people that we uh, we are taking into the uh, uh, into the coaching uh, conversation, because these are the people who will respond to challenges. Their ego strength is healthy enough for us to challenge them. But if people are psychologically unhealthy their ego strength is weak and fragile. And if we were to challenge that, that will, uh, they might break and uh, it can cause them more harm. So as coaches, we need to be able to, uh, to make that distinction, to be able to understand that. Yeah, and CEOs who say, I don't, I don't have anything to coach about. Oh. Yeah. Okay, we'll just chat then. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have had the, uh, I, I, I was saying I have had, but I am currently having a client who came from the sports background. And it's such a joy to, uh, to coach such people because they have gone through the experience of having a coach to make that, to give them that small tweak in order for them to perform better, perform better, perform better. And when you coach such people, it's such a joy because they are hanging on to everything in the coaching conversation to look for changes that they can make in order to uh, grow. It's such a joy to, uh, to coach such people. Yeah. Private so, clients, I find, uh, are so much, uh, so much more um, nice, nicer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And and these people they look for challenges. <laughs> you because challenge they them and they'll go further. <laughs> they really want it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Okay, so that wraps up what I um, uh, have prepared for, for this evening. Uh, I would like to apologize for the mix up in the slides uh, earlier. I hope that uh, you have gained something uh, valuable from the session this evening. So coming to my five favorite part of the evening to be able to hear from you, what is your uh, takeaway? One or two things that you took away from this session that you found useful. So I'm going to use my uh, favorite technique of starting off at the bottom of my screen. So the honor goes to you, Ines. So what's your takeaway <laughs> for this morning for you? <laughs> oh, Mazurk. I took notes from some things here. You know, my takeaway is that everything I learned from the neurosemantics, even meta coaching trainings and APGs that we are running now, you know, everything starts in my, my brain to, to make, uh, to, how can I say, the points, they, they link the points. Really? So, yeah, and this self actualization is behind everything, I think. So I'm just putting things at the right place. So this is my takeaway, putting more uh, stuff on the right place to understand them, how they are linked. Yeah. Thank you, Mazurke. <laughs> Thank you, Ines. I appreciate that very much uh, from you. And I'm moving on to Zakaria. Uh, if you would like to share uh, one or two things that you take away from the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think the pre congratulations. Uh, your presentation has been very informative and interesting to me. I fully enjoyed it. Now, I'm a researcher at the moment at UMS KK. I'm doing a research in uh, English proficiency in primary school based on the framework of international relations, what they call English school uh, society or English society. Now, I think motivation is an important aspect Mm. where uh, learners or students need to learn any subject. And uh, English in particular, in the area that I'm researching now. So a big, I think, thank you to you in terms of this presentation. I think it clarifies a lot on my ignorance on how to motivate, what motivation is, why, why, despite in school, people are not learning. And this, these are among the things that I want to look at, I want to know. Mm. Thank you again, sir. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Appreciate what you said. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you got that for yourself and I hope that you will enrich your life with that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank so you, sir. next, I'll move on to Hashim. Uh, thank you, Mazuki, for the great sharing uh, this evening. Uh, my lesson learned today is about uh, when you conduct coaching, you are actually uh, putting your client into the uh, resourceful state. Mm -hmm. And to get your client into that resourceful state, like the client is not motivated in terms of you know, not to learn or not to improve uh, his or herself, uh, that's where the the coaching uh, conversation come in. That's why the coaching skills come in. So I learned a lot from you today. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ashim. Appreciate that. Uh, Sarah, you're next. Um, there was one point you said earlier. I think it was uh, slide three. I, I didn't get to write in time because that was when my daughter just came in to say hi to you guys. Um, but she was not on video. Um it was something about how you how you see life is how healthy what was it how healthy your relationship with others or something yeah so yeah that that one really spoke to me um because let's just say you know if you're in a coaching business and then you want to be a successful coach for example but if your relationship and how you relate to others 
isn't great, <laughs> then it doesn't, there's only so much you can go. So yeah, in, in that sense, like relationship with others come, I would say, yeah, uh, pretty much important uh, in the ranks of wanting to be successful, that, that personal relationship, you know, with parents, spouse, children, friends, and with yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. Uh, Christian, go ahead. It's on mute. Okay, so Mizuki, uh, Mizuki, I've wrote in like a whole like 10 pages more. <laughs> so, so what stood out for me was um, self-actualization is socially exported and experience. How you get along with others is how you get along in life. Mm. And especially you can't talk any better than you think. So those few things really stood out for me because it is you, how you talk is a reflection of how you think. Yeah. And the socially supported thing is, um, is really, I think it's a, it's a cognitive distortion. Some of us might have, I know I had it before where you think where you achieve people will dislike you achieving or being your best self. Mm -hmm. Um, and my own experience in the last month, I've been sharing things I thought people wouldn't like. And when mm -hmm. I say like, they would have disagreed or find negative. And it just, the positive reaction was so huge. It, it was jarring. It was like, wow. Um, and then something else, I coached, uh, a, a, I would call him executive, but he's more an entrepreneur uh, two nights ago. And it was just one conversation. And that where you said uh, self accession is one conversation. Um, it was, and I was so surprised the next day. It was just 24 hours because we had to have an interview. And he's like, I've never worked this aligned before. I feel lighter. I have purpose, meaning. Wow. And all we did was the um, spinning icons. Mm -hmm. So it was an hour and 40 minutes of just talking. Bringing in the skin that it's like a tennis person or a athlete. They, they want that challenge. They want mm -hmm. that. Uh, how can I improve? And I was just constantly mirroring back, acknowledging. And then at the end, okay, so you have these two inner struggles let's do the spinning icons. And it was just a quick conversation and he just exploded. Wow. So it, I, I really love all of this. So thank you. It really just gives more meaning to everything I've been focusing on. Wow. Thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Christian. Appreciate that very much. Uh, next, uh, Guat Ching. Go ahead, Guat Ching. Thank you, Majuki. Uh, today we talk a lot about meaning making and my key takeaway, um, uh, Meaning making is not just to construct. It's not just about to construct a great meaning, but it also involves to remove the unresourceful or toxic meaning. So, meaning to say that we need to remove the unresourceful or toxic meaning. Then only we can bring in the great meanings to improve to 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 bring you to the next level of self actualization. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much uh, for that, Guat Ching. And uh, last but not least, uh, Tessie, go ahead. Um, yeah, this thing about uh, the deficiency needs cannot met cannot be met by, what did you say? The same, those same needs, like you can't satisfy a deficiency need with another category. Yeah, can you clarify that again? I think that's so, so big. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, physiological need has to be gratified from that category. So, a physiological need. Yeah. A physiological so, need. Physiological need has to be gratified from that category. A right. safety and security need has to be gratified from that, uh, from that category. category. So if a person is feeling unsafe because the person is homeless, how to gratify it is get the person to be living in a home. Then that safety and security will step in. Similarly with love and belonging. Love and belonging comes from relationships. So it can only yeah. be gratified from relationship. When people try uh, to try to superimpose another category on that category. It just doesn't work. No. Oh, this is huge. Thank you for this. Thank you uh, for that. So with that, we've come to the end of our uh, session for this evening. It has been an honor for me to be meeting uh, with all of you. 
uh, you, you've come from uh, different places. So uh, I, I hope it's been a wonderful morning for you, wonderful uh, afternoon for you, and wonderful evening for the rest of you. And uh, I look forward to meeting uh, all of you again in the next session. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you and may God bless you and may you have wonderful life uh, and experiences. So thank you very much. Hope to see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye for you as well.